Hi guys, uh, my name's Anthony. I'm a cybersecurity specialist here at West Point Cyber Time. I uh, hope you're all doing well. Um, first of all, obviously, just want to thank everyone for attending the webinar. Uh, really excited for this one. I uh, had a quick chat with Paul yesterday. Um, we were setting everything up and um, it looks at some really interesting content. So I say looking forward to it. Um, just a quick one kind of before we start, uh, we'd love you to kind of head over to our LinkedIn page um, and have a little look at um, a series of short films we've been doing uh, to kind of celebrate Halloween for a bit of fun. Uh, with the team here and kind of uh, setting those ones up. Um, let's say great for you guys to have a little look. Um, yeah, so today we are joined by, by um, Paul Barker um, of Vigilance Consulting. Uh, he'll be talking about the kind of popular buzz, buzz, buzzword in the industry, uh, resilience, and what that means for the future um, of cybersecurity. Um, if you've got any questions kind of throughout the um, talk, please put them in the Q&A se uh, section. We will kind of go uh, have a chat with Paul afterwards and go through uh, all them at the end of the webinar. Um, so without further ado, uh, over to yourself, Paul. Lovely, Anthony. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here talking with you today. Um, so first of all, just a little bit um, about me. Um, I, it's quite pertinent that the guys were using uh, a sort of a boxing match analogy, um, something that I'd, I played around here. So here we've got Sonny Bill Williams of security, um, you know, looking to defeat the, uh, the resilience in the blue shorts. So we'll see how the conversation goes over the course of the hour. As for me, uh, I'm an operational resilience risk and crisis management director, uh, over 20 years of leadership experience across capital markets, investment banking, asset wealth management, private equity and treasury sectors, so very much financial services. Uh, and I look at operational resilience frameworks, crisis management, continuity, risk and threat management, cyber and information security uh, and information controls. And just at the bottom of the screen there, you've got some, some details if you do want to reach out uh, and, and connect with me, um, as I love to have uh, lots of active conversations on LinkedIn about all of these topics. So. Um, really just want to set the scene to start off with um you know we're all we're all aware of the of the the global disruption that we we live in at the moment um there's so many presentations that are covid related at the minute i'm, I'm determined to make this not about the uh the, the pandemic but it's certainly acted as a really good example to many people who perhaps weren't really um, aware of the, the security or the resilience fields, um, it's brought that to everyone's attention. So that's actually a really positive step forward. Um, so we live in a highly VUCA world. What's VUCA? So it's volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous. And I think there are none of us out there that would, would try and say that the, the current state of affairs is any different. Um, we've had some very stable economic times um, you know, not necessarily great economic times since the financial crisis of 2008, but we've certainly had stability in terms of interest rates, in terms of forecasts, in terms of outlook. And that sort of lulled people into this sort of sense of stability that we, we've experienced. But more recently, um, whether that disruption, disruption comes in the form of uh, a global pandemic or uh the, the type of area we're talking about today which is which is criminal attacks uh on personal and corporate um, assets um then certainly that volatility is there um we've got the, the joys of brexit thrown in so you know lots of uh, lots of global um local macro and micro um incidents issues and concerns that we need to be aware of uh and, and as ever, cyber attacks continue to be on the increase. Uh, I've seen one report that said 88% of data breaches in 2020 still due to human error. Um, but across that phishing, we've seen increase uh, by 600% just in Q1 of this year. Uh, and the FBI is citing an overall 400% increase in cyber incidents um, since Q1 2020. So you know, what's undeniable is that um, the threat vectors are currently outweighing the solutions. And, you know, as we saw, those of you who, who joined uh, Ian Murphy's presentation uh, a week or so ago in the Cyber Lounge, will have seen his visual with sort of 200 different solutions 
uh, on a single slide, an absolutely busy slide. And yet, despite all of these tech solutions, we're still getting the disruption. We're still getting disruption to services. Uh, we're seeing theft, theft of personal sensitive data um, and corporate IP. Uh, we're also seeing threats to critical national infrastructure uh, and plenty of financial fraud in there as well. Um, you know, the insider threats is another area. Um, frequency in the last two years has gone up 47% and the cost of those um, two businesses has gone up by a massive 31% in just 24 months. So, you know, you've got, you've got the incidents and the attacks increasing You've got budgets increasing for greater spend on cybersecurity. And yet at the same time, in the people side of things, you've got an awareness apathy. You know, we've all sat there, we've all seen our inbox ping with, um, you know, the latest round of compliance training, you know, that we have to go through and click the buttons to get through to, to tick the box at the end, because, you know, a lot of those trainings, they just don't contain anything that's useful to us. Um, and, and, you know, with all that, with people working re remotely, you know, there are situations where people have either got other things that they are prioritizing in terms of their brain power, or they're just so um, used to seeing this stuff about there that actually there's now a bit of an apathy um, in terms of security awareness, and that's really not helping. And then the final thing I just want to talk about in terms of the, the, the global context is poor communication. Um, so at the start of the year, there was a survey of, of, of boards done uh, and in the top five problems for boards, despite the fact we live in a digital age of immediate communication, comms was still classed as one of the top five issues at board level. So if at the right at the top of the house, we still can't get that communication right, what chance is there that that communication is going right further down the house? Um, and so that's really something that we need to, to bear in mind, because I think it plays quite a big role um, in, in how we've arrived at the situation we're at right now, in terms of the number of, of, of breaches and attacks that continue to go on, despite all the efforts that we've had. So just quickly looking, um, you know, a little bit of a story so far, you know, we start off in the 1970s, where mainframes were the size of, um, of your living room. Um, really isolated and it was all about keeping um, the thing cool and um, keeping it running, keeping it powered, keeping the tapes changed over. And then as we moved to into the sort of the 1980s, so around 85, we had Microsoft uh, Windows launched, starting to see that the personal computer starting to take note and therefore that computer security evolved into IT security by the addition of that human element uh, of, the, of the user. Um, and then, you know, as that sort of timeline moves forward and into the late 90s, but really into the 2000s with the advent of or the widespread advent of, of the Internet um, as, a, as a globally available um, and workable um, <clears throat> sort of system. All those who remember 56K dial up will remember the pain of reading your emails, whereas today, you know, it's a very different piece. And so that entering of the digital age actually saw a divergence um, in the security world. Um, one, you've got cybersecurity continuing along the, the bottom there, but then you've got the, also the other information that's not held within the computers, not held within the data. So it's the stuff that's printed off, it's the stuff that's held in, in filing cabinets, it's the stuff that gets taken by users on the train and left on the, you know, in the back seat of the taxi. So you sort of see this divergence between information security coming off and cybersecurity sort of continuing on the traditional route. And so what I want to look at today is whether or not actually that, that loop is starting to actually, are we starting to see now a convergence? Um, because you're, you know, that information security has then butted into risk management, it's but, butted into physical security, uh, and it's now starting to um, get mixed up in the, in the resilience world. And to me, I, I'm a believer that, that it's resilience that is pulling all these things back together and making them a more holistic exercise that we need to, uh, we need to attend to. So let's just look then at the cybersecurity bit of it. Um, so the National Cybersecurity Center uh, will define cybersecurity as how individuals and organizations 
reduce the risk of cyber attack. Um, you know, this is a pretty stock definition. Um, but if you look around, I mean, for example, uh, NIST will say uh, that it's the process of protecting information by preventing, detecting and responding to attacks. So again, it's very much a defensive um, a posture. Um, you know, it's also been defined by the NICCS as the activity or process ability or capability whereby information and communication systems and the information contained therein are protected from and or defended against damaged, unauthorized use or exploitation. So again, very much that defensive um, posture and um, putting up the walls, putting up the multi-layers and even, you know, looking at national cybersecurity, they're quite precise about it as being, you know, it's the smartphones, the laptops, the tablets and the computers, as well as the services that we use. So again, it's quite, it's quite narrow in terms of its, its definition. Um, and a lot of the effort is um, put towards the prevention or the stopping of, you know, the, the, the water leaking into the boat, if you like. Um, and I think that is typified by if you if you simply do an image search within Google and you type in cybersecurity, probably 95% of the images that pop up on the first few pages will contain a padlock. Um, and it, I think it's just it just talks to you know that sort of defensive posture uh, of of cybersecurity. So entirely valid, um, entirely necessary part of the part of the process. Um, but the argument is, does it always address what happens, you know, when that breach does occur? And we'll come to that in a little bit longer. So, you know, cybersecurity, if you look around, um, the majority of, of roles, role titles, um, articles that are written, they're still talking about cybersecurity. So cybersecurity, very much the current title holder, um, often seen as, as quite a discreet and protected specialism. Um, you know, certainly through engagement on LinkedIn, we've had some fairly lively chats with people who, who seem to get very angry um, with people who, who aren't clear about the difference between cybersecurity and information security. Um, and, you know, there was one, one particular chat that I had a, 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 a lively conversation with about it, and he just wouldn't let it go. And in the end, I couldn't get him to understand that outside of the security world, nobody cares. Yeah, it's all wrapped within this sort of protective, defensive uh, piece, um, and the, the 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 semantics between the information and the cybersecurity, you know, quite frankly, weren't aren't going to be the interesting um, necessarily at the board level or elsewhere uh, in the user community, and I think that's again something, um, you know, that's been spoken about quite a lot recently, and. Um, to do with the sort of hubris and the, the sort of talking in, in very complex jargon, um, out teching each other in terms of uh, qualifications or, or, um, or language that's used. So I think there's, you know, it's very much built up a, a, a culture within the cybersecurity uh, sector um, and can be seen as quite insular. Um, that said, there are multiple recognized frameworks for cybersecurity. Um, you know, whether you're talking the ISO 27000 series, whether you're talking the NIST um, series, or even things like COVID coming in as well. Um, the, a lot of the focus of when you read the sort of academic texts around this is cybersecurity is around building the castles. Um, so it, it's again, it's about having those walls, having the, the keep in the middle, and then your, your various layers of, of walls outside. So this raises a conversation to, to see how, you know, is it really that proactive or is it quite reactive? So we're proactive in terms of forming the different layers of defense, um, but are we still sitting there waiting for an attack to come um, and therefore then looking to, to, to react to that and defend the castle and the keep, um, you know, from, from, from attack um, even if it's at the cost of some of the outer layers of the defense. I think more recently that's certainly changing and we're seeing quite a lot more proactive threat hunting. Um, we're seeing people going out there and actually uh, 
uh, more mature organizations are actually going out there into that trying to prompt um, attacks and trying to get you know, you know surveillance of the dark web and, and really try and get ahead of the curve there but I think that's probably quite a small pocket and I think we've already talked about it in terms of the, the plays well with others. One of the comments that I see quite a lot, um, you know, in, in anything related to cybersecurity is quite often, just leave it to us. Let us get on with it. <clears throat> Sign off the budget. We know what we're doing. Um, don't interfere and, and just let us get on with doing what we do. Um, and I think that historically that has been successful to a degree. Um, but I think now we're starting to see that, you know, the ability to play well with others, um, and we'll come back to it when we look at resilience, uh, I think is going to be a key part of, of taking um, the, the industry forward and taking the sector forward. So, um, you know, I'm sure there'll be people who, who completely disagree with that, that view, um, but I, you know, that's me taking quite a business view of the cybersecurity people so again sometimes perception is not necessarily what you, you intend but it's how you're how you're received on the other side so i think there is a, a need to be aware um, of that that perception issue so we talked about it on the previous slide um you know uh this is this is the the, the very high level uh, of the nist cybersecurity framework um interestingly um, you know, we have the identify, protect, uh, detect, and then we've got the respond and recover. So a lot of people in the cybersecurity world might be saying, well, we're already doing the resilience um, because we've got this, this, this respond and recover uh, elements to it. Um, but you could also then argue that, that you know, it's, it's the last two thirds or, or two fifths of the, of the piece. Um, if you look at what's in there, yes, there's response planning. Yes, there's recovery planning. Um, there's some analysis in there. There's some action taken um, to respond and recover. But the question, you know, fully remains, does this constitute resilience or not? I don't necessarily think that it does. Uh, and hopefully we'll go on. Um, we'll, we'll go on to look at that in a bit more detail. But this is um, what's what is interesting is um, is there are some there are some people for whom the shift from cyber security to cyber resilience has been a control F exercise. So they've got into their existing document that's about a cyber security framework and just press control F and you know for the word security replaced with resilience, you know, and press go. And it's really, I don't think it's it's that simple. It's not just the latest buzzword that we, we now just call it cyber resilience instead of cyber security, but just carry on doing exactly the same things. And I think it's a little bit disingenuous that perhaps some of the organizations have, you know, grabbed hold of, you know, things like NIST and they're now trying to call them cyber resilience frameworks. Uh, but again, we'll come back to, to that resilience aspect um, in a little bit. So in terms of this, um, Back in 2015, um, Axelos um, put out there uh, that it's, it's about the ability, cyber resilience is the ability to detect, prevent, detect, and correct any impact that incidents have on the information required to do business. Um, and when you look at that, and when you think about that, that doesn't feel to me much different to the definition of cybersecurity, uh, because you've still got those sort of core elements in there. Um, you know, what I did like about it is that it talks about it being the, the thread that runs through all business initiatives, activities, projects and programs. Um, and this is a key element, it needs to involve people, process and technology across the organisation in order to be successful. And that is the active participation of everyone inside the organisation cascading down from the board level. You know, I, I always call it boardroom to postroom. Um, and it's got to be that 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 degree of um, it's got to be that degree of consistency in order for it to be effective. But I think that one doesn't necessarily go far enough. Um, and as I say, it's been an evolving piece. Um, so here we've got the again the National Cybersecurity Center definition, which I like a little bit more. Uh, which is an organization's ability 
uh, to withstand or quickly recover from the cyber events that disrupt usual business operations. Now, again, the, the part about quickly recovering, we could argue, is quite similar to, um, to the cybersecurity element. Um, but for me, the critical part there is the inclusion of the word withstand. Because I think this is one of the evolving parts of, of the overall resilience world. Um, and it's not just about, you know, recovering once you're breached. Um, and, you know, if there's been a disruption, getting back up to operating as quickly as possible. We're starting to see now more pressure both from regulators and from, um, you know, and from customers to actually be able to carry on regardless. Um, and, you know, one of the things I often think about is, is those of a certain age who remember Monty Python um, and in, in Life of Brian, you've got the, the Black Knight and, you know, as more limbs are being chopped off, he's still, you know, he's still telling the guy to come back and finish him off and have a go, you know, so despite all the setbacks, you know, he's still looking to, to deliver the service um, that, that he started off with. So I think that's, you know, that that withstand bit is really quite important and isn't necessarily something that we've looked at um, historically in, in, in the pure cybersecurity lens. Um, bizarrely, one of the, the best definitions that I've seen for cyber resilience um, <laughs> actually, you know, is attributable on Wikipedia. Um, and it's cyber resilience being an entity's ability to continuously deliver the intended outcome despite adverse cyber events. And I really like that definition because it's nice and simple. Um, you know, it's a perspective that I think is, is gaining a lot of, of recognition because it's, you know, in order to do it, it's bringing together a number of different capabilities, not just the defensive posture of cybersecurity, but also bringing in um, you know, other aspects of security and business continuity, as well as risk management, you know, all together in a sort of team effort to make sure that, you know, whatever incident befalls us, that actually the customer receives an uninterrupted service, albeit that that may be at a slightly um, suboptimal level, but nevertheless, we don't see the, the disruptions. And when you think about that in terms of the financial services industry, one of the things, you know, the key things we're talking about here is, um, you know, if there was an attack on the ability or an attack on the ATM system, and suddenly um, nobody in the UK was able to withdraw cash from, um, from the bank, um, that's just not a situation that we could tolerate because that in itself could trigger um, its own economic crisis. Um, you know, in terms of a rush on banking and a rush on deposits, which could then have far reaching consequences. So, you know, it's no longer any good to say, oh, that's no good. The ATM system has been breached. Um, there's some malicious code in there. It means we won't be able to um, issue cash, you know, through through the, 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 the ATM system for, you know, two days, four days, six days. Um, that's really going to shake the confidence of the market and not do anybody any good at all. So, it really, for me, a big part of resilience is about um, moving it forward to not just being able to uh, respond and recover, but actually to not go down in the first place, not be knocked down off your feet. So it's about taking the punches and moving forward. Um, and as, as I showed on that continuum, which uh, you would have seen if the slides have been working, um, where, where information security um, sort of uh, went off at a tangent from, from cyber security and has, has mixed uh, more widely in the organization in terms of its engagement. Um, you know, we're seeing that cyber security is no longer this sort of isolated preserve of the IT team, um, you know, who are responsible for it because actually, you know, the digital age has meant that the, the, the IT, the kit, um, the services, you know, with a lot of software as a service, platform as a service, you know, it's everywhere in the organization. It's no longer um, acceptable just to have the IT team um, managing the whole thing. And so it fits into this sort of wider piece. Um, and that piece, you know, um, starts at the top of the house. So if we work from the top of the house, what we're looking for is either 
enterprise or organizational resilience. Um, and that's defined by ISO in 22316, 2017, as the ability of an organization to absorb and adapt to the changing environment to enable it to deliver its objectives, survive and prosper. And I think that sums it up overall. And it is an organizational or an enterprise wide uh, imperative. It's the enterprise imperative for boards right now. Um, it, it crosses over risk, continuity and security as a whole. And I, and I deliberately put just security there because it's not just cyber security. It's not just information security. It's also corporate security. It's, it's individual security. Um, and it's the physical security around you know, the organization as well. So it's really everyone together. Um, and given, given the world that we live in, that we talked about at the beginning of the, of the session, um, you know, that level of disruption, that level of uncertainty means that this is this resilience aspect really has to be one of our one of our top priorities um, to to address and really sort out. Uh, we've all probably had experiences of of um, certain companies who've responded really well um, in 2020 to the changing conditions, um, able to make their workforces remote, able to continue to deliver. And we've also seen those organizations who simply haven't been able to adapt, um, haven't been able to um, move forward uh, and be successful. And some of those businesses have failed uh, and some of those businesses will probably fail over time. So we, we've got at the top of the house, we've got this organizational resilience. Uh, and really that breaks down into two elements. So you've got the financial resilience and that's something that boards certainly are very comfortable with. You know, this is about making sure the finances are good. The, the traditional risk management is there. So we're looking at our credit risks, our market risks, our liquidity risks. You know, can we pay our staff? Can we pay our bills on time? You know, all of those things, whether you're a financial services organization or not, your company, your organization will be very familiar with that financial resilience um, aspect of management. Then as we've seen the risk profile um, across industries change with the digital age, you know, those sort of market risks and, and liquidity risks have stayed fairly static. What's actually sort of grown exponentially over the time is this operational resilience. Um, and with that, the operational risk environment as well. So we've seen operational risk go from just being operational losses um, to now having subsets of upwards of 100 different subsets of operational risk that we need to look at. And within that, things around cybersecurity uh, and reputational risk um, as a result of, of poor social media presence or poor customer um, feedback in terms of things like Trustpilot that can spark um, very critical incidents um, have all come much more to the fore but I think it's fair to say that from the board level, people are, are still not 100%, uh, board members are not, not entirely comfortable um, with this aspect of operational resilience. And within the financial services sector, that's something that the supervisors and the regulators have really grasped hold of. And whether you're in the States or whether you're in, um, in the UK um, with the, the consultation papers that are going on now, which are, uh, those regulations will be coming to force at, at late 2021, possibly now into 2022, um, to really focus, I make this a, a, a board imperative to get this right. Um, because it, 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 it can have such, you know, it, you can have all the financial resilience you want, but if you don't have the operational resilience, then as an organization, you're still not gonna survive and prosper. And that's the, the, the name of the game. And that's where I think there's there's this other part of it um, that, that comes into resilience, which is about opportunity. Um, now we've actually seen, you know, I think Zoom is what is a great example of a company that has absolutely taken the opportunity of 2020 and used it to really drive forward um, its it, its agenda and its its growth strategy to become the solution for people to use. Um, you, you know, for easy remote meetings and whether this is done through um, the personal situations 
and the, the myriad of quiz nights that people are now um, forced to go to, or um, whether it's, it's schools or, or organisations using it now that they've sorted out some of their earlier security issues, um, you know, you've, you've seen a company really survive and prosper. Um, Amazon, and again, another, uh, another success story, you know, really responded, um, have, have barely missed a beat in the whole in the whole uh, of 2020, you know, still delivering next day delivery on most things um, and really being key to people's um, successful ability to carry on their lives in a normal way. So, you know, taking the enterprise approach, working well with others and collaborating is, um, you know, is definitely something that, uh, you know, I think Mark's resilience out as being different because it's about not only keeping going, but in keeping going, you're also using that to find those um, opportunities to actually take advantage and exploit the current situation and move forward stronger rather than just reinstating, you know, the previous system. Because, you know, in a lot of instances, certainly in 2020, reinstating the previous system actually is no good because your operating model has completely changed over the course of six, three to six months from a, an office-based workforce to a remote-based workforce. So a lot of your recovery plans to go backwards won't work. It's about seeing the threats that are coming, responding to them, continuing delivery as you go, and actually learning and feeding that back into the organization so that you're moving forward. So it's important to remember that defense is only ever half of the game. So even the Department of Homeland Security have jumped on the, the bandwagon uh, and they will actually now um, conduct for organizations in the States. And it's always good to look at what the US is doing, um, certainly in terms of this field, because quite a lot you know, will filter down um, from the States. Uh, and they will actually conduct um, with um, certain organizations that have uh, either sort of local governments or uh, involved in critical infrastructure, they will actually come and do what they call a cyber resilience review. Uh, now, this is quite interesting because, you know, they're looking at, at 141 practices and 42 goals across 10 domains. Uh, and the domains are listed there on the screen for you. Um, and yet, bizarrely, the foundation of this whole review comes back to the NIST cybersecurity framework, which then, you know, does that call back into question, you know, whether or not, you know, what was being done on cybersecurity um, was enough? Perhaps, uh, and there may be those people that argue that, but I think that, you know, the fact that this is looking at situational awareness, the fact that this is looking at training, um, you know, that's bringing in the vulnerability management piece more, um, you know, your external dependency management. And of course, we're also not talking just here about what's inside the organization, but now from a resilience point of view, we're much more interested in, in a cohesive piece on, um, on your supply chain, but also your supply chain, but also your third party vendors and anyone that you outsource to. Um, so in terms of is the IT department or the cybersecurity department also responsible for those third party risks or are those being handled elsewhere i think i've seen um some information recently that's that suggested um perhaps that that, that whilst people were checking that third-party vendors and supply chain organizations had a continuity process um they didn't actually have any sight of whether that continuity process worked or not uh, and that's you know that's quite a risk to take uh, in terms of this. So I think, you know, that's certainly, um, you know, interesting to see that there's still elements here where it's still a little bit wedded because we don't have, we don't have an equivalent resilience framework necessarily that's been, but that's been put together to sort of take NIST to the next stage. Um, where does that leave us going forward? Well, um, you know, whilst they haven't updated the NIST framework, 
um, some of the other resilience pillars, um, you know, so you've got risk management, you've got um, continuity, uh, and you've got the sort of cybersecurity side of things as, as what I see as the three main pillars. Uh, but you'd also have sort of facilities, third party uh, risk management teams, um, corporate services, corporate security, um, a number of other stakeholders involved as well. Um, <coughs> excuse me, but some of those guys are already stepping up. So um, the, uh, the Business Continuity Institute uh, has done a recent survey uh, and, and Business Continuity Institute runs on um, a set of good practice guidelines as, as their kind of framework. Um, and they've been consulting with members recently to say, does this, this GPG adequately cover the cyber element? And, and wholeheartedly, the answer was no, it doesn't. Um, so they're actually contemplating, do they need to revise and update their good practice guidelines to accommodate this, this cyber resilience aspect? Or do they actually write a whole new set of guidelines just for the, the cyber element? And, and actually the responses from the membership was very much no. If you go and write something separate, then that becomes another silo. And that goes against the whole tenor of what we're trying to achieve at the moment, which is actually more collaboration um, and better communication between previously siloed um, functions. <coughs> um, other interesting things that came out of that, that BC, uh, BCI survey uh, was very much um, quite a lot of deliberation over things like the business impact assessment and whether that would actually be done by the business continuity team um, or whether that would be done by the cybersecurity team. So I think one of the things that that's really highlighting is about clarity and roles and responsibilities. Uh, that's something that as we start to play well with others across the enterprise, we must be really clear about who's responsible for what. Um, and, you know, without that, we're just going to have confusion. It's going to perpetuate the blame culture. And that's not something that's going to be useful going forward. So, you know, successful collaboration requires clarity um, and it requires good communication. And that comes all the way back to what we talked about at the start, which was even at board level, they're still struggling with communication, even in the digital age. So it's something we're really going to have to work on. Um, Knowledge um, is another thing. And again, we talked earlier about these sort of silos and quite insular and defensive characteristics, whereas actually what we're seeing now in the resilience world is a need to be much more open. So again, uh, in this, this BCI survey, they're talking about um, doing some cross pollination of skill sets. So perhaps moving people from their business continuity team into their cybersecurity team and vice versa. So that actually we're sharing and spreading and being transparent about things, breaking down some of these, these silos and this, this sort of hubris around um, technical jargon. Um, we all know that organizations love a good acronym. Um, and it's all about, you know, speaking in plain English, understanding things from the customer's point of view. Um, and really sort of being that team player. And that's really where the culture element comes into this. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and it's, a you know, those companies with a good culture where everybody is vested in um, helping to deliver the business outcomes and objectives of the business is likely to be successful. Um, and you know, when you when you use that culture, people are going to be less apathetic. People are going to more likely to demonstrate the right behaviors, identify those opportunities that are there. And if the communication works and the collaboration works, then those opportunities should be able to find a way to the solutions table and actually come forward and, and lead to, to forward positive action. Um, so there's, you know, there's, there's plenty that we can do, um, and it really involves, you know, a, a bit more of a sharing and caring attitude, um, a bit more open, clear and transparent communication, um, a willingness to roll up our sleeves and do whatever's needed to, to get done, 
um, and really to have the mindset that you know we're all in this together and as, as Bernard Shaw says progress is impossible without change and those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything and I think if I if I leave you with one um, symbol if if the if the padlock has been the 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 symbol of cyber security then I think the lighthouse is the symbol of resilience um, because as you can see from the image there no matter what mother nature throws at it that light will keep on shining um, to keep mariners um, safe at sea and I think you know whatever comes it's about continuing to deliver the vital and critical services um, as we go forward. Anthony, I don't know if you want to see if there's any questions. Perfect. Sorry about that, Paul. Um, brilliant. No, um, no, perfect. Thanks so much uh, for that, Paul. Really, really interesting. Let's say lots to kind of. I guess try and take on board and consider isn't there and, and kind of to take away from it as well um i hope obviously everyone kind of enjoyed that um as much as i did um as uh paul kind of mentioned there you know we'll kind of do a bit of a, a q a section now um you know so please kind of any questions or any topic you know things you kind of want to discuss even with paul um you know please put them in the in the chat um just to the side there um so you know i'd like to kind of kick that one off with you know you've um you focus Oops, sorry, mate. You've um, you know, you've focused heavily, um, you know, on security and resilience uh, within the financial sector uh, industry. But you know, is it uh, is this relevant, obviously, to to the other industries as well? Um, yes, naturally, I focused on 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 financial services because that's my primary background. Um, I also think that that given you know, the world that we've lived in since the 2008 financial crisis, um, you know, that's been something that, <clears throat> you know, has really led the way in terms of how markets have grown, how the economies have grown. Um, and in terms of that, that fear of uh, the unavailability of, of financial services, I think that's something that can affect everybody. Um, so, you know, one of the things we've seen within the financial services environment is very much that that regulation is coming in, um, you know, and because the industry hasn't done enough by itself um, to self-regulate and therefore the regulators have felt the need to step in. That's probably going to wash over into a, quite a number of other industry sectors. Um, and so, you know, you can, you can do two things. You can one, look at it and go, Oh, well, I'm not in financial services. I'm not subject to that regulation. I don't need to bother. Or you can say, um, actually, there's an opportunity here. We can see what someone else is doing. Um, and actually now is our chance to look for what's great about what they're doing, what's great about what they've got, um, and try and pull that back to your own industry and see which bits you can, you can apply now that keeps you guys ahead of the curve um, and, and potentially avoiding, um, you know, future future regulation. Cool, cool, perfect. Um, so so another, another one here, mate. Um, so this is what cybersecurity teams have always done. Um, you know, why not just leave us uh, to deliver this? Um, yeah, and I think I think that's probably. Um, that, that's probably a viewpoint that, that many will have. Um, and I think it, it comes down to that, you know, we, we saw it within the, the resilience slide, the three cogs, uh, and it is about being a, a cog in a, in a very bigger, much bigger enterprise machine. Um, and, you know, as I said before, with you know, with the way that the digital age is affecting our, you know, our personal life, you know, everything is run, you know, through a mobile phone nowadays. So we can't get away from, from, from IT there. Um, it's the same with our, with our working lives, particularly where we're remote and we're using um, remote systems collaboration tools a lot more. You know, we just simply can't afford just to make it the responsibility of one team because there are just too many facets of it. Um, you know, you need to have 
um, you know, you need to have a continuity plan if your systems go down. Um, if the building burns down, you also need a continuity plan. Actually, if the building goes down, you need both of those plans to work together. And I think it's about that need for collaboration that I think is important. Perfect. Perfect. Cool. Okay. Um, so we've got a question here from Louisa. Um, with the current COVID restrictions, how do you promote working together as a team, uh, you know, keeping staff motivated across departments? Um, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, it, I think it, not to use the standard answer of it depends, um, but unfortunately, the, you know, that, that is the start of, of the answer to every question, isn't it? Um, if you work for an organisation that has thought about things, is, is, has planned well, um, and you have a good and open and transparent culture, um, or you've been used to using collaboration tools because you've been working cross geographies, you know, a lot of those people have found very little difference. Um, yes, you have uh, fewer phone calls and more Zoom calls, um, uh, but in terms of that ability to um, focus on, your, on the work you've got to do and have your collaboration time, I think a lot of people have found that relatively easy. Conversely, where the culture hasn't been so strong and people feel a little bit more left out in the dark and, and poorly informed because you know, probably in those organizations, you've got more of a, you know, the people at the top all communicate regularly and they know what's going on, but that doesn't filter down to the rest of the organization. I think in those situations, people will have found it really difficult um, to, to have, have coped with the remote working because you feel very much alone. And it's about, um, it's about making sure that your team members don't feel that they're alone, even though they're remote. And that's a, a very different thing to being um, on your own and being alone. You know, it's that whole alone versus lonely thing. And if you if your staff are effectively feeling lonely, then all of these things, you know, because you've got poor communication, you've, you're just getting the same old, you know, do this test um, to pass your compliance checks, uh, um, you know, and that's all we care about is the tick in the box then that's what's going to happen. If you care about what the people are doing, who are sitting in the chairs, who are helping your organisation, that will really work. So it's about being open, it's about being transparent, and it's about offering suggestions and ways of doing things differently. So it's improvise, adapt and overcome. Cool, cool. Yeah, no, completely agree. Um, no, great. Um, okay, so we've got another one from um, uh, Joe here. He says, Paul, um, can you comment on the need to have real simulations, uh, actually recovering systems, e.g. in test environments, as opposed to just do paper-based exercise, especially systems supporting manufacturing environments where downtime is an issue and difficulty to have test environments, you know, 100% rep, uh, replicating production environments. So that that's, that's a tough one because, you know, <clears throat> when you're, when your preparation for disruption causes disruption, uh, that's a very hard um, that's a very hard challenge for management teams to accept. Um, uh, and whilst there are, you know, it, periods of time for for many organisations, um, and and actually I've heard it quite a lot recently about organisations who who trade with them or do business and have offices in the Middle East as well, um, that you don't even have the weekends now because there's a lot of weekend working out in the Middle East. Um, so it's not even like you've got the same periods of downtime that you could run your, your simulations at night when your manufacturing's down, but we're now seeing 24 seven manufacturing, so that can't happen. Um, it's an interesting one because it's always got to be a balance you know risk management which is essentially what, what what this comes back to is all about um, implementing mitigating controls but you only implement those mitigating controls if they cost less than the um, risk you know the cost of the risk materializing um, so i think we are gonna we are going to continue i mean firstly you have to do your paper-based 
stuff first, okay? Right, you have to do the desktop exercises first because you have to make sure you can run on paper and everything runs smoothly and you've ironed out all the creases in that piece. Once you get ready for simulations, there is a lot of pressure coming from uh, regulators and government agencies now that partial tests are insufficient to actually um, rate resilience. Um, and this is something that we'll very much watch over the next couple of years um, because we are seeing greater demand for whole system testing. So it could be something as much as if regulation demands it, you might find that um, Bank A may have to give notice to um, all of its customers, you know, retail customers that on the following day, they will not be able to withdraw um, money from, a, from a, an ATM because that system is being tested. And again, that's when it comes down to the communication with your customer base to say, look, we're giving you, a, it's a bit like a flu jab, you know, we're giving you a tiny little bit of inconvenience now to prevent you from having a massive inconvenience later. Um, so it might just be, again, some of that mindset that needs to shift. I don't think that will be overnight. Um, or we'll come to the point where, uh, and this is the costlier one, we're going to have to set up enough systems and redundancies that you can um, literally switch from service A to service B. Um, the customer sees no difference in terms of, of what, they're, what they're, they're doing, um, but you're having that seamless transition. Now, that's a very expensive um, way to work, and I think we're going to have to be really careful quite how much pressure there is to you know, which, which services we need to do that for. Um, but you literally need that sort of backup generator, um, you know, to, to, to go straight in and continue delivering the service. So, um, you know, as a good comment just come through there, the data center approach to recovery can be used. So you switch between data centers. And I think that's the concept, very much the concept, uh, quite how you do that in a manufacturing base with a, um, with a, with a whole bunch of machinery that's producing, you know, cars, for example, you know, do you move to car plant B uh, or, or C or D? You know, lots of things to, to, lots of details to work through, but conceptually is about having that redundancy um, and to an extent negotiating with your end user to say, what, what would you prefer? Would you prefer a little bit of disruption every now and again versus the chance of a catastrophic failure of systems? Uh, I know what my answer would be. Oh, cool. No, perfect. It seemed like that kind of first part comes comes back to kind of the communication again. Um, yeah. Your, your, initial, your initial point there, doesn't it? Cool. Okay. Yeah, look, there's, a, there's an interesting comment there mm. from, from Trevor. Four Dagenham used to cost $1 million a day to do a shutdown. No. Oh. So, you know, if companies are going to have to bear that kind of cost to do a full system test, there needs to be a very, very strong rationale for you know is that actually going to save a 30 50 100 million pound event um if that one million pound is taken once every two years for example it's kind of going back and weighing up the risk i guess isn't it um as you, as you, as you mentioned earlier obviously cool cool okay um so i think we've got one more uh question here obviously you know guys keep, keep the kind of uh questions and kind of points and uh, debates, if you like, kind of going. Um, I think last, last chance for any more questions. Um, so, what does this mean in terms of kind of roles and responsibilities? You know, kind of who 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 is in charge? Um, yeah. So again, you know, historically, business continuity sat within the domain of the chief operating officer. Um, Certainly what the international regulators at the Basel Committee are, are trying to suggest is a uh, very much pushing it under the responsibility of the chief risk officer. Um, and you've got perhaps different responsibility chains. So you might have cyber risk is reported to the chief risk officer, uh, but the, the actual cyber security might report to the chief technology officer, um, you know, or even your, your CISO. So you've got these kind of different matrices and, and in, in some respects, spreading that responsibility around the C-suite is good 
Um, but it's only good if you're absolutely crystal clear about who's responsible for what. So I think the, the short answer is it doesn't really matter um, if it sits here or it sits here or it's a bit of both. It's about making sure that you are clear in documenting and understanding where those responsibilities are. And those responsibility lines, they also need to be drilled and tested as well because you need to make sure that those are foolproof. And especially in times of stress, if you've got one key person missing from that authority chain, um, you know, that's not gonna work. Um, so I see some comments there about going, you know, bring it into the, the SMCR, um, the senior management certification regime. Yes, we've got, you know, again, a heavy pressure between that COO role and the, the, the CRO role, role. So the SMF4 and the SMF16. Um, and, I, and I suspect it's going to be moving to more towards the CRO for financial services organisations in terms of engaging with the board. But there is still going to need to be that great collaboration between different C-level, C-suite officers and their teams um, in order to make this work, because I don't think it's ever going to fall just to one person. Cool. Oh, okay. No, brilliant. Um, okay, so a question from Marcus. Um, he's got an um, um, overarching question. Um, just a few days ago, I did read um, that we're actually at war with all the cyber crime going on, uh, especially now thinking about SMB. Uh, shouldn't it be the responsibility of the state uh, to provide something like a SOC as a service to raise uh, the resili uh, resilience? Um, thinking about ENISA on the continent. Um, and, he, and he's gone on to put, I have a feeling that a lot of companies simply cannot afford the services, you know, let alone kind of, you know, run a sock by themselves. I, I always, I'm always hesitant to see the state step in. Um, you know, for, for, for many of those reasons that, you know, they, they, they're always going to be influenced by powerful players uh, and therefore design a system and a service um, that might be very effective, but also is, is highly costly. Um, I would prefer to see um, the competition in the market. I mean, if you look at uh, how many people are out there offering cyber security solutions, endpoint solutions for one particular type of threat, if you look at the plethora of, of organizations and the money that's being spent alone on marketing all these different solutions, and if it just a percentage of that were to be redirected towards um, the provision of these services and, and, and at a price point where you're looking for volume, Right, because how, how do we get defended? You know, you can have something that's really expensive that one organization in six can afford. Well, that's not a defensive line because there are five gaps in between every strong company, right? And 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 eventually that's going to work its way through the ecosystem. Whereas if you if you can do something that again it's it requires a bit of social enterprise, it requires a bit of collaboration across industry, um, and to not always think about profit. Um, for one, but profit for everyone is 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 it's a it's about adoption of these things, and it's the same as making these frameworks sort of you know these ISO frameworks. Why aren't these things free? You know, why do you have to pay to to look at a framework that actually makes you know part of the national infrastructure more stable? You know, so there's lots of things like that for small companies, large companies. We need to think about cost. We need to think about more open source. We need to think about more collaboration and more competition in the market. Um, and that's all going to be driven by customer demand. And if the customer demands it, someone will come up with those solutions. I completely agree. Um, yeah, let's like say this, there's, there's no easy answer, unfortunately, is there? So it's, uh, um, I think you can look at it from almost any angle. But um, no, no, fantastic. Uh, thanks, Paul. I think that's kind of the last of the questions. Um, obviously, you can just take take uh, this second to kind of thank everyone for attending. Um, you know, it's been fantastic, and obviously, massive thank you to Paul uh, for delivering the talk. You know, uh, certainly a lot that we can kind of all take from that, and let's say sparking up a debate in 
as I'm sure you kind of chat about it for, for, for a long time, to be honest. But, um, uh, you know, do, do make sure that you obviously connect with him, you know, on LinkedIn, you know, see kind of similar content and, um, and you know, obviously see what he's kind of getting up to. Um, uh, you know, we're considering running a panel kind of focused on resilience and, you know, with a few other kind of industry experts, you know, if there's something that, you know, uh, any, anyone here would like to do, then obviously certainly let us know. Um, of course, we'll kind of send over the full webinar uh, to everyone who's kind of signed up um, to you shortly, so you can kind of sh share or watch that at your ledger. Um, and yes, yeah, so, you know, we'll be running kind of another webinar uh, next week on the 4th. Uh, it's actually based on kind of the lack of control businesses have um, when so many are kind of working from home. Um, we can kind of, you know, we'll send out obviously an invite link to that uh, for the full webinar. But um, yeah, obviously, again, thanks so much for your time, Paul. Uh, it's been a pleasure, mate. Um, and yeah, obviously, hope everyone has a great day and uh, catch you all again soon. Thank you. Perfect. Cheers, Paul.